More than 30 years ago, the project on the history of Black writing began its investment in preserving and recovering the history of Black writing today. And oh, today we remain committed to creating critical spaces for teaching, learning, researching, and presenting Black literature, both in the US and globally. As such, we're very pleased to present our fifth webinar in Black Poetry After the Black Arts Movement, a summer institute funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our special guest today is the poet Jessica Kerr Moore, a trailblazer and groundbreaker, a unique figure in contemporary poetry. I'm Derek Smith, assistant professor in the English department at SUNY Albany. And uh, before we get started, I um, want to just note a, a logistical uh, detail. In order to facilitate our interaction with the guests today, uh, we'll be using two of the tools that you find in the upper left-hand corner of your webinar window. We will use the chat tool to provide immediate feedback uh, think of it as a place for virtual applause and encouragement. Encouragement. We will use the Q&A tool as the place to collect questions for the poet to answer in the course of the webinar. And you are, in, you, you are encouraged to use both actively. Uh, you might start by using the chat window to provide a special virtual welcome to our guest today, Jessica Caremore. If anybody wants to do that, go ahead. Uh, so I wanted to begin today uh, with an introduction of uh, Jessica. And I, I have to say, it's really, it's really a blessing for me to do this and to even uh, be in conversation with her uh, because her work is so expansive, diverse, and impressive. Uh, it's even hard for me to really encapsulate in just a few sentences all the thing that all the things that she's done, um, and I feel like we might spend like half the the the, the webinar just talking about um, just introducing some of the projects that Jessica's been involved in uh, since she really emerged into the American cultural consciousness with her performance of Black Statue of Liberty on the one and only is Showtime at the Apollo. She won five times in a row. That was a record. Um, that was in 1995. And since then, uh, Jessica has performed her work all over the world. She founded More Black Press, through which she's published the work of poets like Saul Williams and the poet mayor of Newark, Ross Baraka. She was a friend of Ross's father, Amiri Baraka, and is a friend and I'd say artistic descendant of other luminaries of the black arts era, like uh, Haki Madabuti and Sonia Sanchez. She's published four books of poetry. Some of them are titled, The Words Don't Fit in My Mouth, The Alphabet Versus the Ghetto, God is Not American. Her work is featured in numerous anthologies and poetry collections, and her performances have appeared in major films and television programs like Russell Simmons' Deaf Poetry Jam. She has produced and hosted her own television program, she has established the Just Care More Foundation to promote literacy. She started Black Women Rock, which is best described as a, a movement that's supportive of uh, 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 Black women rockers. <laughs> uh, she's a conceptual artist whose work has appeared in various galleries. She's a proud native of the D, otherwise known as Detroit. She has collaborated with some of the most important rappers in the history of hip hop, like Talib Kweli and most deaf, Yasin Bey, and on Nostradamus, the fourth studio album of the incomparable Nas. It is her poetry that serves as introduction to the whole piece. Uh, her poetry also appears on Young Jeezy's most recent album, Church in These Streets, and she has her own album, which is Beautiful Fire, and which I just downloaded from iTunes. It's titled Black Tea, the legend of Jesse James. She's a mother, she's an activist. Uh, I'm sure she's many other things as well. And I'll throw in this also, she's very gracious 
Uh, and so it's really a just an honor to be introducing here, uh, introducing her to you. And uh, I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. Can you say something to the crowd? What up, though? <laughs> You're so sweet. Thank you, Professor Smith, aka Derek. Uh, no, you're awesome. Thank you. I was just um, put on the chat saying that my bio was too long, so I'm sorry. But thank you for <laughs> for reading some of it for people who may not know some of the stuff that I've been working on. But yeah, no, I'm just excited to have this conversation and, and have everyone who's tuned in to listen and ask me questions. And yeah, let's let's go. I'm ready. Okay, great. And, you know, as I said, I think we were just scratching the surface also. So it wasn't like I was, you know, embellishing, you know, somehow <laughs> sometimes bios are like that. But, you know, I don't think it was like that. Um, yeah. So in fact, what I want to do is, you know, I want to call attention to the to the bio that I just uh, uh, outlined there. And it's diversity. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's sort of far ranging um, engagement. And I kind of feel like, you know, like, where did you get the nerve to do all that stuff, you know? And so, as I said, like, people may be aware of you as coming onto the scene uh, with Black Statue of Liberty, but, you know, I want to know a little bit more about who was this woman who came from Detroit to Harlem, that rocked the crowd there, you know? What were the foundations of your, 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 or your artistry? Well, I, I was I was 22 when I did the Apollo Derrick. So I was just, a, you know, I didn't know I was young. <laughs> I thought I was really uh, very, you know, grown up. I had moved to New York in 1995. Um, but I'm from, I'm my daddy's child, you know, Tom and Irene. My mother um, was from, born in England, but raised in Canada. And my father was a construction worker his whole life. Um, he was very a lot older than my mother. Met her in Canada. She, when she was 17, she had four little yellow black babies on the west side of Detroit. And I come from working class people. I come from union worker people. Um, my daddy, during the riots, you know, went to jail because he had his rifle on the porch, you know, protecting his family, protecting his home when they lived right in Highland Park when they were burning the city down. And, um, and so I come from that. I'm a post-riot baby, you know. And so, you know, we came up, you know, during a time when, you know, things were kind of sleepy. We had inherited the civil rights movement. You know, we knew that it happened, but we weren't necessarily feeling it directly. And... Um, so I'm a 70s baby. So I came up, you know, and, you know, I mean, from Detroit's a special place. I, this is a place where nation, the Nation of Islam, you know, was created, you know. And so it's very, I, I knew, Com I'm a Komine Young baby. And if people know Detroit history, Komine Young was that mayor, right? I knew, like, this black, powerful, smack-talking, like, killed the media, quake. I mean, just he was, you know, integrated fire departments. Like, I remember all of that history when I was just in high school. You know, I admire Coleman Young. And so I came from a very, like, I wasn't in, like, grew up in, like, one of those Marcus Garvey nationalist kind of homes. But I was, I definitely grew up in a home where I was, I was a, I was a black girl, you know, and I stood in that. I went to all white Catholic schools from first to eighth grade, which made me even blacker, you know, <laughs> because then I was called all kinds of names uh, and chased home and harassed um, because of the color of my skin. And so, but at home, I had a very utopic kind of existence, you know, in my Canadian white family, um, very open. I didn't have any white American family members. So they were just, they were Canadians. So it was just a completely different energy, you know. And, and then my daddy's from Alabama. So I'm Southern, you know, like I'm country, I'm country and you know, thank you for saying I'm gracious, but I really think, just think I'm supposed to be humble because I was given a lot early. You know, I became, you know, my life changed within five months, you know, of moving to Detroit. And when I was in Detroit, I was a known poet here. I opened for the last poets. Um, when they came to town, I was already established enough. And, and my voice came out of an activist space. Like I was, I took over, I went to Michigan State. I, I protested there and fought to bring Farrakhan, you know, there at 17 years old. I took over Wayne State University when I was there and helped establish the King Holiday. So I was a rabble rouser, you know. It was about action. It wasn't like, I want to be this poet that's better than all the poets. Um, there was no Deaf Poetry Jam. There was no, I hadn't done the Apollo yet. Um, the only poet I'd ever seen on television at that point was Reggie Gaines. And he did the Air Jordan's poem on Arsenio. And I think I was in seventh grade when I saw that. And it just it rocked my world. I was like, there's a poet. I was like, man, there's a poet. He's talking about gym shoes and people dying over shoes. And, and I was, you know, and that's funny because when I did go to New York many years later, I was looking for Reggie Gaines. I was mm. looking for all the poets I read in the New Yorkian Poetry Aloud anthology. So I was in Detroit 
I was, there was no new Eureka. You know, we had this place called the Pommy Cafe. That's now a club. It's like up the street, literally from where I live right now. And it was like a hair salon and slash poetry spot, you know, and that was Detroit. Like I performed poems at hair shows anywhere. And I was on the hip hop scene. So I was around when Proof and M Eminem was becoming who they were. And, um, you know, Slum Village. I mean, you know, the about 10 with my friend, um, John, people who know, knew JD. I knew him as John Doe was one of the first producers on the east side. I was in JD's house. Like, I was like, yo, I wanna put my poetry over some beats. You know, and JD was like, yeah, we should do it. You know, and um, I don't know, we about to record something that's just gone now. But there was something happening with me very early that I didn't know it was, been that, and I didn't, it wasn't until like 11th grade in high school that I realized I was actually connected to other people in history that already had done it. You know, I wasn't being taught about myself, so I knew you know, T.S. Eliot and Whitman. Emily Dickinson was my favorite poet because I, you know, all black Detroit public school, right? I went to white, white Catholic school in eighth grade, then all black Detroit public school. Honors English student, you know, four varsity. I'm on every varsity I'm playing. I'm, a, I'm an athlete and I'm a super nerd and I'm a good English student, but I'm not giving Audre Lorde. I'm not getting Sonia. I'm not getting any of that. You know, my mother gave me, my mother I was surrounded by books. And so I always credit my mother because she, she ate books, she still does, she read, but she didn't read fiction, she read memoir and nonfiction. So that's what actually what I read now. I'm not really a big fiction reader, um, unless it's like Toni Morrison, that's be really smart for like, me to like, like it. And, um, but I like people's real stories, so memoir and non and history. And so, yeah, and so that's some of what I think shaped me, um, but I definitely had, you know, I, I worked with, you know, I got involved with Nation of Islam, and then I found Sunni Islam, and a lot of my friends were Muslim, and I grew up on the border of Detroit and Dearborn, so I grew up a lot of Arab, big, the largest Arab population, you know, in the country is in Dearborn. So I grew up on that, on that street tireman that separates, so I grew up with Arab kids. And, and so, you know, it's a lot of that informed me, but my father was a big, big influence, because I never saw my daddy work for anybody. He never worked for a white man, ever. And that's, that's a big deal, you know, to watch your daddy. While some people really went to the plants, like that's not his story. Like he didn't go work for GM for Chrysler. He had Tom's trucking and everybody worked for my daddy. And my daddy made everybody's cement, you know, driveways. And so that's exactly who I am. Like, so it, it completely informs why I would start more Black Press in 1997. You know, after winning the Apollo, I had Faith Childs as my literary agent. I had Chuck Sutton as my manager. I turned down three record deals, you know, um, and I was 22, 23. Yeah, I was a baby. That's stuff that people get, you know, lose their mind over. And because it came so fast, it just humbled me. And I was like, well, I thought about my daddy. Like, what would my daddy do? My daddy would say, all right, people will like my poetry, more black press, because that's what we need. We needed more black poets um, in book on bookshelves. And I didn't, and we'll talk about that, I know a lot later, but you know, my, my upbringing in poetry wasn't from television or performances. It was, I had to read hockey. <laughs> I had to read Sonia. I didn't, I didn't live in Brooklyn or Harlem. So they didn't come to Detroit a lot. So when they came, it was like, dun, 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 Mary Baraka is coming to Detroit. Um, but these, I met, I had that Black Poets anthology. It was, you know, falling apart. And I, that was my Bible. So I was reading Larry Neal and I'm, you know, Naomi Law Magic was my mentor here in Detroit, who, you know, is connect, who's our poet laureate, who was Broadside Press, you know, and so I, I was a Broadside Press baby. And so I was, I came more out of the, very much out of the literary tradition, more than, more than not. And performing at Apollo in front, in Harlem, in front of some black people, is just like, that's just like reading at a hair show in Detroit. Like, it just makes sense. Like, and as a poet, I think the work I wanted to do was to get to the people, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be this poet and you have to go find me up here on the hill. I wanted to talk to people in a voice that they could relate to and get something from. So, so that's, you know, that's me. I was a little, I was a little basketball, a little hooper, you know what I mean? <laughs> I talking trash. I have five older brothers. Um, I grew up with two of them in my house. So that's where the fearlessness comes from. I had a daddy in my life, my whole life. You know, when I moved to Brooklyn, I wasn't scared ever. My mother's like, aren't you scared? It's three o'clock in the morning, you're on the train. I'm like, man, there's so many people outside. Like Detroit is like quiet and deadly. You know, it's a dangerous city, but it's not like a bunch of people walking around on the street, you know? Right. Yeah, so it's a different kind of danger. And so New York, I felt so, I felt so safe there, mm. you know? Yeah. You know, um, in your uh, description of your foundation 
there's also an element of the next question that I really wanted to ask because as I, you know, I've, as I expressed to you before, I kind of divide contemporary poetry into like these three provisional categories. Like one is like literary poetry, another is spoken word poetry, and then there's hip hop or rap, right? right. And usually <laughs> for me, that works, you know, it's a kind of good conceptual apparatus to use. But, but like you are one of the few figures who I think really um, tears that apart, right? And you kind of, you're one of the few people who can operate in each one of these poetic registers, each one which has this kind of separate institutional backing, you know, and it's, it's separate conventions. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about like, what is your relation to these different modes of poetry? I mean, it's deep because for me, it's all the same, right? Um, but as far as audience building and like getting outside of those boxes, that has been, I have walked all those lines. I, I remember, uh, I think it was Asha Mandeli, when she saw me read with the band, full band at National Black Arts Festival, she was like, oh, okay. She said, that's what you do that's different from me. Because me and Asha are similar. You know, the writing is, if you look at an Asha Mandeli poem and Jessica Kimmer poem, it's not like so different. It's a kind of similar approach similar kind of heart and honesty and authenticity in the writing, um, heart on our sleeve, telling you what it is, very clear, very black woman voice, um, and a lot of heart in it. But, um, but also, I'm not a scared of music. Like, I love music. I grew up listening to a lot of rock and roll, and I loved, um, I loved P-Funk, and you know, I loved Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, and I don't know, and just for me, the Poetry Cafe was such an insular kind of space. And just being from Detroit, like I never, that was never my space. We didn't have those spaces. So I wasn't used to non-traditional spaces. I was looking like, where are the people at? So I went to the hip where the, where the rappers were going because they had an audience. So if Proof was hosting a, a thing, I'm going. I'm like, yo, Proof, let me on the mic. I'm going to do this poem. And they would just, and they would give me the space. And, and for a woman, that was a big deal because, you know, those, those rap scenes are still very male dominated. You know, it's a very male dominated industry. And so, um, and the thing is, I, it's not like I infiltrated. Like in, in New York, you know, most and Talib were on the poetry scene. Mm -hmm. um, so, was, so were M1 and Stick. Um, they were, we were all performing together. Um, I was on shows, I, we were doing uh, Black Lily or whatever. We were on shows with, with um, Tribe Called Quest. And, you know, it wasn't all this separation. I know, but it's funny, I was just with another poet, um, uh, older poet who teaches out of Mississippi. His name is Escaping McKinnis. And he was like, you know, he remembers when, when hip hop hit and some of the hip hop artists were like coming to the poetry scene that like, he was mad about it, you know? Whereas for me, I'm a, I'm a hip hop generation poet. I'm not a hip hop poet though. I'm definitely like aesthetically different than my, I remember most, you know, most deaf, you guys know him as most deaf, Dante looking at my work and saying, I don't write like this, you know? That we aesthetically recognize the difference and as poetic as he is, there's still a different approach. There's a different level of study of the craft of poetry that I did that I can't get away from. If you listen to me on the Jeezy album, I can write as good as Jeezy. I can maybe write better than Jeezy. But, so, but on the album, when I'm listening to people, these 20 something year olds who are listening to the Jeezy album and finding me on Twitter, they are recognizing that I'm a poet. That the, my approach to the, how I sound, they're not saying this rapper girl, they're saying this poet on Jeezy album is bananas. Like the, they know that I'm a poet. You know, and so we're, we're kissing cousins. And so the spoken word label has been something I definitely resisted. Uh, and I, I did it for political reasons. You know, the first, after the Apollo, first five years from 95 to 2000, I mean, most of my money was made in, on university settings, in, in the academic world. That's who brought me. Black students brought me on white campuses. English departments brought me. Women's studies departments brought me. Anything poetry, something, something. And, that's who brought me. But when I saw spoken word on the flyer, I started questioning why they were putting that. And I said, because, well, you know, we didn't say spoken word in 95. You know, this is a new thing. Like when I was in Detroit, nobody was saying spoken. We we're like, we're poets. We're black poets. Mm -hmm. So maybe black poet. But I was like, wait, so if you're a black poet, you're automatically a spoken word artist. I was very, I was getting confused by it because it was just this new thing that came. And then some of the younger poets were like, that's what they would wanted to be. They were like, you know, screw the academy, screw that literary stuff. And then so here I am becoming an elder to people who are sometimes older than me or younger than me. So the idea of what an elder is, right? So I remember Kevin Powell saying, we're, we're elders and we're still young. 
So we're still, I'm still young in it, but still saying to you, hey, no, no, you're not a spoken word artist, you're a poet. And telling the poets, no, you gotta, you gotta write, you gotta write books. You can't just make these CDs. And so I was like snooty like that. Even though I was being called the spoken word laureate of my generation, that's a quote. I was like, someone introduced me as that, and I was like, what? I was doing like the Sonia Sanchez keynote at the Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky Women's Writers Conference. You know, very literary conference. I was like, don't call me that in front of all these writers. And I realized that as a black woman, as a, as a black girl poet, black woman poet, I wasn't being allowed to be a writer. Because writer means you're an intellectual. Writer means you think. And spoken word artist means you perform. And I was like, I'm nobody's monkey. You know, I was like, I'm not doing, I'm not juggling up here for y'all. Like my poems are not for your entertainment. And my poems are for liberation. My poems are to free myself from this, you know, this, this Western world we live in and keep breathing and take care of my children and feed my spirit and take care of my community. It's not something trite, you know what I mean? Like, I, and I took myself that serious. Like I took myself that serious and in my, tw- in my early 20s and, and 19 and 20, 21 years old, I was overly serious. My work wasn't as good as my seriousness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jessica, yeah. let me, let me, let me like, ask you maybe this would be a good time for actually for us to hear some of the poetry so oh. you have some pieces that you could share with us yeah I have like a thousand <laughs> <laughs> right right so we'd love to hear some of the poetry uh and then you know we could jump back into commentary on it after you've given us a, f- a couple pieces maybe okay no problem maybe i'll do this piece hi that's my son he's probably walking into the shot king <laughs> hi king all right so i'll do a, um this is damn right. This is a piece I read at, um, <laughs> I read at, um, actually at Amiri Baraka's funeral. So, you know, Amiri was a good friend of mine and, and a mentor of mine. And he called what I, he called my name when other people didn't. And so you know, he called a lot of our names, he called Saul Williams' name, Tony Medina. And he actually recognized that there was a continuum, you know, of black, of the black arts movement writers. And so this is called uh, Damn Right. The death of my father at 69 reminds me that every new year is a kiss from God. Or maybe it is simply a reminder that catching bullets in our teeth are not just for comic book superheroes. That literary giants also battle against the monstrous heads of Connie and Bill and survive unscathed. Attention critics from nowhere. You might be forced to wear your spine to work today. A midi Baraka is busy with a higher calling. Somebody got to ask, who going to be the messengers? Where is Sun Ra? Where are the Holy Ghosts, our prophets? Wise, 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 do they call us hip hop or say we slam when we are your students, Baraka? The invisible ones, the spooks that knock down doors. We don't juggle or hopscotch or jump through fire. We write. We know your bright sons have plans for this morning. We know your daughters are reimagining the night. Others began writing our suicide letters for us a long time ago, ignoring the young cultural revolutionaries. You taught us how to breathe inside the polluted cesspool of segregated libraries in the name of Baraka. We dance, we teach, we tear down, we build up. We believe in the face of the faithless. We move for those who be stiff. We fly for those who be still. We have no choice. He created this fire. Who gonna keep it lit? Scholar with sword, master teacher with miracle as metaphor. Who gonna call the ignorant ignorant to their faces on national television? Who gonna make love inside of eight bar blues? Here comes the heart, here comes our city, here comes the people. You don't have to extra- explain your chakras, just breathe. Here comes Baraka, down right here comes injustice, down right here comes protest, here comes the hat tail, here comes the b-boy stance, here comes freedom, here comes peace. Who gonna spike the tea? Who gonna plant a poem and grow a life? Who gonna bring the scholars out their ivy tower prisons? Who gonna call a spade a king and I'll joke the joker? Who gonna build the low coup bombs with the world and our bookshelves dying a little more every day? Who gonna teach the children? Who gonna rebel? Who gonna go into our prisons? Where are our redemption songs now? We conjuring the whole truth of language from the scraps of a twisted alphabet. Chitterland backwash taste of bitter standardized testing and watered down curriculums. We are the economy of pyramids. We the who we bees and the what we did. We what they thought was hid. Damn right these words don't fit. Damn right the record skip when your life is a calling. When the ancestors have prepared you for the politics. How do you pick the red pill or the whitest fence when our cities are born with the bluest eyes, the darkest tails, and the most beautiful African people who don't know they is African? Who's cutting the grass of the killing fields, the dream dealers, the beat creators, the painters, the poets, the movement? people, the truth tellers, the lovers, the liars, oh bless you, the liars. Whose blues they gonna steal now? Which names they gonna mispronounce? Leave out, set back, pretend not to know. He created this fire, who gonna keep it lit, huh? 
Who going to print the books? Who going to program the silences? Who going to own the bookstores? Who going to burn the house down? Who going to tell them the revolution is your mirror? He created this fire. Who going to keep it lit, huh? Rock a black, rock a jazz, rock a blues, rock a dance. Till there were no shoes to drag. Where you from? Detroit, Newark, Harlem, Tuskegee, Berlin, Palestine. Who gonna feel the art for art? Who gonna be the new? Who gonna recognize the old? Who gonna identify your soul? Spirits don't lie, but the papers do. Who gonna control who remember you? Me, me, us, us, we, we. Damn right, your stories are that of a lion. On the front line of American schizophrenic jungle. Prophet footing and warrior ink blood. They cannot kill us all. With their black face and tragic twisted imitations of life, we understand a Mirti Baraka has outlived your double cross. His books held political prisoner by unestablished, unsophisticated establishments. We hold his words as armor, as a symbol of our fearlessness. We ask his children, his wife Amina, for permission to claim him. We smile his boyish grin, waiting for the Loku bomb to drop. He teaches us there is jazz playing every time the sun rises. A jackal of words, a blues man with a hat always in place. You, father of movement and possibility. Barack of black and artistic, handing out pamphlets full of rebellion and resistance. We know your life work is simply an answer to a question. Why God? Why ancestors? Why Malcolm? Why Langston? Why Jane? Why Lucille? Why Haki? Why Eskia? Why Gil? Why Sonia? Why Last Poets? Why Asha? Why Tony? Why Saul? Why Thomas? Why Mike? Why Kevin? Why Akira? Why Ursula? Why Lamar? Why Willie? Why Carl? Why Major? Why Lisa? Why ancestors? Why brilliant? Why organizer? Why fathers? Why uncles? Why scholars? Why SAS? Why teacher? Why legacy? Why black genius? Why Baraka? Why God? Why in the hell did you have to make me a poet? And God replied, Leroy, somebody had to show him how to do it. So, <laughs> all in my dining room. <laughs> Thank you. No. Wow, that was great. That was beautiful. Thank I you. came. How you doing? Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Jessica. I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that's really clear, uh, just from that reading, in case anyone didn't know, is the um, sort of the political uh, perspective that you bring to your poem. It's never far from the surface. In fact, I would say most of the time it's at the forefront. Um, and I want to give you a break before you do another poem. And I want to uh, I want to <laughs> ask you I want to ask you a question um, because uh, one of the as one of the one of the things that you do is you 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 dedicate poems to people right to significant <laughs> figures. And uh, I, the the poem that you written for uh, Trayvon Martin was really oh, beautiful. Um, and I and I wanted to just I want to ask you a couple things about it because uh, there's. It's it's a really it's beautiful in a in a in a sort of tragic kind of way, um, but it also gets to another element I think that makes you unique as a poet uh, today, and that's like your own sort of uh, your own status as an independent woman and poet, not affiliated with an institution beyond yourself necessarily, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah, you have this poem. There's a, there has to be a, sla a safe place for boys. Yeah. And you, you have this devastating lines about like black boys and commodity culture. And it's beautiful, right? Uh, because they're so true. And so you open the poem uh, with a reference to, quote, brown boys who lace their will and dreams inside designer shoes. And when I read that, I was kind of like blown away. Because you know, I think of myself when I was younger, and I think of my own, my my two own brown boys, and so many more who do exactly the same, right? Invest so much of ourselves in these products, right. uh, and, and and part of what makes them beautiful is because they're so tender and understanding, right? right? And later on in the poem, what you do is you open up a really another kind of ironic truth, right, about commodity culture, which is mm. in these lines, they suck the cool out of black boys to sell their cars and shoes, then criminalize them for looking like their own ad campaign. It's incredible, right? So my question has to do with like your own relationship to commodity culture as an artist, right? Because you describe yourself as like a, a, a hustler of poems, as someone who has to sell poetry to put food on a table. Um, and so like, I'm thinking like, how does that reality like impact your art? And sort of as a, as a kind of another question, like if someone was to give you a MacArthur Award, half a million dollars tomorrow, how would that, would that change your art at all? Would it be affected? That's my, that's, so that's a question around there. I don't teach and then do poems on the side. I've been a full-time poet for over 20 years. And so 
yeah, it's how it's how I make a living. Um, and I mean, but it's how you know it's how Sonia's made a living. It's how Amiri Baraka has made a living. You know, most of us made a living. You know, have made a living showing up. You know, for appearances. Um, but it's a it's not like a hustler in a way where I'm like I'm writing because if I was a hustler, I would be writing urban fiction. You know what I mean? Truly, I I, I can just put some bad covers together <laughs> and get my urban fiction on and write some like. You know, some stories about, street, I got street stories for days. I actually thought about like getting a pen name and doing that, you know, doing my, getting my Donald Goins on. And, um, and so, yeah, it's survival, you know, I'm a mother, you know, and I have uh, a 20 year old earth son that I raised on poems, my son Omari, um, through my first marriage to a poet named Sharif Simmons. Um, so I've been a wife. You know, so I've, you know, and I've, I've taken care of my family. You know, I haven't, I haven't been like a poet that's like married to someone that's taking care of me. So I can just be cute and write poems. Like it's been like, it's contributed to my household. So, and now I'm a single mom with my son is nine. I've been raising him by myself on poetry. I remember this woman asking me this question in Kansas City, almost like in poetry. Not that she was, she was very much judging, not judging, but she was trying to figure out like, how can you do this? Because I'm a single mother and, I, and I'm a poet, but I couldn't do that full time because I have to take care of my son. And so my answer to her was, it's the opposite for me. I have to do this so I could take care of my son. This is the best way for me to be my best self around my child. And if you ask my son, King, who interrupted a few times, like, who does mommy work for? He said, mommy works for mommy. And it's, there's something empowering about that that has given, that has definitely informed my nine-year-old in the way that he walks already in the world. And, you know, and is already going to be a threat to people who don't like black boys who turn into tall black men who walk a certain way in the world, right? He's going to be one of those boys and one of those men. And because his mother is telling him, you can be free, you know, and, you know, and, and you know, and I do teach, you know, like I, I teach though. I teach where I want to teach. I teach in the ju juvenile detention centers. I've been teaching in Kansas City in the juvenile detention centers, excuse me, in St. Louis for seven years. Um, I've been in Redwood, California doing workshops and teaching in uh, maximum security prisons in Rikers. I, and I'm in three schools in Detroit, you know, doing, um, I hope you're not losing me, doing um, artist residency work in poetry and mural projects. And so stuff where I, can control <laughs> what's t being taught, where I'm building the curriculum and um, not someone telling me what to teach. You know, and I know that for people who are, you know, in, in professors, you know, and we need professors on, on the, in the academy, but we need curriculum changes so that you can actually be a teacher that can actually teach, you know, so it's not all this regulation where, you know, you got to hit those, requ those core requirements and all that. I I'm not that kind of teacher. I'm going to give the, the, teach the kids what they need, you know what I mean? And, I'm not going to, having to adhere to that, I don't know if I work in that space correctly. So, yeah, I don't know. But I, I make it work. You know, it's definitely not an easy life. And it's not for everybody. It's edgy. You know, sometimes I have money and sometimes I don't. <laughs> but I'm all right, you know. I got enough for us. I ain't going to be hungry, you know. Like, my, my son has everything, you know. He has everything. Well, this, uh, that's, a, that's a great response for it, Jessica. Thank you. Um, I wanted to try and bring in a couple of the questions that people have given us so far, right? Because I, I don't want us to get to the end of the hour and then not have uh, some of these questions. I, heard, I saw Meta. Meta is asking a question. Is it Meta that I know Meta? I love Meta. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Meta. <laughs> so she has a question here. I'll, I'll give that one to you first. Uh, and she says, given your work as a multidisciplinary artist in poetry, plays, your one woman shows, and your contemporary work as a visual artist, uh, can you say some things about your relationship, about the relationship uh, between poetry and these other modes that you work in, art artistic and political? Yeah, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like right now I have uh, the second version of my ballet is being presented at Stalman College this, this next semester. And so I wrote a contemporary ballet with poetry, you know, a Detroit techno with all Detroit techno music. So oh, that's it's awesome. techno you know, and contemporary ballet, and it's called Salt City. Thank you. And I'm I'm really proud of it because I just, you know, because I like the people's faces when they I, they say, I say I wrote a ballet, and they look at me like, what do you mean? Like, they don't look it's possible. <laughs> you know, how do you write a ballet? And I was like, I just wanted to see my tech move inside of a body and inside of some brown bodies. And I wanted to be blue collar because I'm from Detroit. And so Akuka Dogo, who 
was the woman in yellow in Indazaki's for Color Girls, is my director, and she's the distinguished scholar at Spelman, and she directed the work, and she's continuing to direct the work. And so, you know, for me, you know, and then the visual piece, I, I couldn't feel like I can draw a, 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 a portrait. I mean, my son is a better uh, artist as far as, like, can draw a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, but I work with Radcliffe Bailey, who's one of our contemporary, you know, artists of our generation, that's, um, and he brought me on a residency in 2010, um, which, uh, it was uh, in New Smyrna, uh, Florida, and there were seven composers uh, with a master composer with, who was DBR, the violinist, and a master uh, novelist and a master visual artist. And Radcliffe was the first time in the history of the residency, which is about 37 years old, that a visual artist brought a writer to be a part of the visual artist community. And so I was doing all this work with all the other people and interacting with the visual artists and, and interpreting a painting and you know working with music is easy for me i love it but he was like you have to make art and so it took me about three or four days and to realize i was a conceptual artist and that if you can think then you can make art was what Radcliffe taught me he continues to be my i mean he's my good friend but he continues to to push me to continue to make art and I ended up taking over the sculpture studio in, um, in Detroit. Yeah, I, I was in a gallery. I was in a show and a couple of exhibitions since then. It's been kind of crazy. Like, I never thought I could sell art. But, it, but it's me continuing to stay with the tradition of using the text. Like, there's some of my pieces. I have markers that say, Ka Haki, Ka Gil. It's like reminders that I'm a poet, you know? And so I'm still saying something. I, but the first big exhibition I did was called uh, Nanak, which is canon, which is canon backwards. And I did all these political broadsides with all the, you know, Will, Walt Whitman and Robert Foss and T.S. Eliot's name going backwards, nice. um, because that's what's wrong with the canon, you know? And then, you know, Sonia Sanchez and Audre Lorde and Lucille Clifton and Nikki Feeney, like all the women that I love going forward. And so I just, I pushed myself to say, this is, I'm a part of the canon. And then I, I did a nude series actually in all these poses and uh, projected T.S. Eliot and Frost and Shakespeare's work, you know, all into my body and did all these different poses because, white, you know, white men's work is, is pushed on us, you know, and, and when we're very young, you know, I was learning about Robert Frost and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, like, you know what I mean? Like, I was learning about these poets, you know, and I was like ninth grade, you know, I was like 13, 14 years old, and it was like basically all dead white men and a couple of white women writers, and so, and they're forced on it, like, and we're told these are, this is the template from what all greatness comes from, you know what I mean? I didn't know about like Robert Hayden, like I didn't, Dudley Randall, like none of those people, Kaki, Amiri, those are all outside of institution of any kind of school, you know? Right, so, right. I don't know what, except that I don't have any fear when it comes to like stages, you know? And I don't think that poets should have that. And I know some of them are terrified outside of the, the literary like little cliques. Um, it's not where I think our work is supposed to stay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, yeah, it, I mean, I don't come from that, you know, uh, oh, yeah. That's, that's great. Can I ask you, I want to get some more of the questions in here. Uh, we have one uh, question from Evie Shockley. She sent in a, a question. Um, and she wants to know about, like, your performances in other parts of the world. Uh, she knows that you've been throughout the world performing. And she wants to know where did you get like the the biggest response to your work, and uh, so it, it, and then a sort of follow up to that, what poets uh, from other parts of the world in the African diaspora or elsewhere, you know, have been important for you as an as an artist or as an individual as a person? Wow, I mean, so so for me, I've been influenced not just by uh, by poets, you know, there, I've been. Malcolm X was a big influence for me. Uh, Kwame Ture, who I got to meet while he was alive in um, New York City, was a big influence for me. Um, John Henry Clark uh, mm -hmm. came to my first play, the New Yorkian Poets Cafe, and I wrote about it. And it, it was amazing because he was John Henry Clark was going blind, and I had only read Dr. Clark, you know. So I'm living in New York. I'm like Dr. Clark. Uh oh. I'm back. So Linton Quincy wow. Johnson, did you hear me talk about him, Linton? No, we didn't hear. That would be great if you were talking about Linton a little bit. Yeah. So South Africa. So, you know, the question is, you know, my, so I've been, um, you know, large audiences in, in Amsterdam and London, like those shows that London was you know, very, it was my first European show. I was on tour with Paul Beatty, who's one of my favorite writers. And, um, and so the reception was always wonderful, you know, in those places. But what the, the international, uh, you know, experience that moved my life was going to South Africa. And the first time I went, I was in Durban and I visited um, Johannesburg and Sonia Sanchez was on a panel 
with all these writers trying to figure out what language, <laughs> debating which language should be taught in South African schools. It was fascinating. And um, the second time I was on tour with Linton Kwesi Johnson, who I love, this dub poet, right? Yeah. You know, Jamaican poet. Yeah. And then, you know, Muda Baruka. I love Muda. You know, Muda Baruka. I loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, Gil Scott-Heron was one of my mentors. You know, I, I, Gil personally asked me to open for him many times in New York City. And I got to know him as a person and, you know, hands-on, one-on-one talks with Gil Scott-Heron. You know, just, that's just... It's golden, you know. You can't buy that, you know. You can't jar it. It's just, it's just either it happened or it didn't happen for you. And it's like that happened for me. And so, and and Abiyo doing it, Umar and Babatunde, the last poets, um, have been very, very. They're like my dads, literally like my daddy. And so they're like my baby became my fathers. And so, um, my friends, I have you know. And then Sonia, of course, has been like a you know literary mother. You know, has been she's my friend. You know, she's supported me. We have long conversations. You know, she's, you know, I've gone through a lot just as a woman, you know, I've talked to her about a lot about motherhood and how she navigated it all. And, you know, you know, when I was in Ferguson, she called me mad at me because I didn't tell her I was going to Ferguson and you're supposed to have your, you know, she's just, so those mentors are in place. But South Africa was bananas for me um, because of the way that we look, the way that I look and you look. When you go to South Africa, you know, because of apartheid, they expect a certain thing from us. And... You know, I, it, it, it me out very black, you know, and I got on the radio, people were like, the, the, the radio, this jockey looking at me like, they let you talk like that? You know, I was like, yeah, you know, my planes are landing, you know, as we speak, you know, so be quiet, don't jinx me. Um, but the freedom that I had and the way that I was so connected to my blackness, you know, I was teaching workshops in Soweto. These kids, man, they were reciting poems to me and just the look on the, on the little girl's faces. And I was doing like, you know, black statue livery, you know, all these little freaking girls are like looking at me like they ain't never seen nothing like me before in life. They're like, who is this chick, you know? But the color piece was deep. And the way that I was treated at these hotels in Cape Town and shit, you know, it was just really disturbing, you know, cause you knew there were, apartheid is not over in South Africa, right? right, right. And so, some of the coloreds, because they benefited from the separation of the from black South Africans, um, didn't like what I was saying. You know, you know, I was very and I wrote a poem called "Even the Light Skin Girls Are Sick of the Light Skin Girls," and it was about after leaving South Africa, just like that being sick of that. You know, not not and I've been always anti that, always that pretty light skin girl with long hair thing, like always rejecting it, wearing my hair pulled back in a ponytail. And being an athlete most of my high school years helped me with that, you know, like mm -hmm. taking the edge off, trying to, you know, I wasn't about, I wasn't trying to be the cute girl, you know, that wasn't my thing. And so, and so it was, but it was, and, and it was embedded and in, ingrained in, in, in everything in South Africa and it hurt, you know, like it hurt. And, and there's a little girl on my show, she looked, she was probably a uh, Indian because, you know, a lot of Southeast Asians are in, um, in South Africa and they, they passed this colored. If you got, it was really about the paperwork. And this little girl was crying and she looked at me, she said, um, you don't understand. And I said, no, I do understand. And she, I said, cause I am you, you know? And so just, you know, I was like, I am you. Like there's no difference, you know? And so she, cause you know, why? And the, I remember I was staying with this German Jewish sculptor in Johannesburg, a beautiful sister, I forgot her name, Susan something. And she's very famous and she's like sculptures and the banks and everything. Her daughter got a hold of my first book, The Words Don't Fit in My Mouth, while I was sleeping in her house. And she was sitting on the edge of my bed when I woke up. And she had like 2,000 questions for me. And the most important one was like, why do you carry your blackness that way when you don't have to? Mm -hmm. Why do you choose to like carry it? And I said, I think I have to carry it. I said, but I celebrate it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I start wearing me down, it's lifting me up. So she didn't understand, you know, the context of where my voice came from, you know, and because she's like, you're American, so you have so good, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I was like, no, baby, it's not, it's not quite like that, you know. Um, so South Africa impacted me in a really, a really intense way. And in Europe, the audiences are always are bigger, you know. They, they treat poets real good in other countries, you know. Yeah. Is there another question? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a couple other questions here. We have one coming in from um, Miss Booker. And it's a really interesting question. Um, she wants to know, as a multidisciplinary artist, I wonder about your shift between genres. This was in interesting, right? She said, so my question is, when you sit down to compose, at what stage do you know what genre the work wants to be? 
<laughs> That's so awesome. What a great yeah. question. Is it Malaika Booker from London? Who is it? I don't know. I'm just wondering. Um, but I guess, you know, for me, I just, I just it's write from, it is a Malaika V. She's bad. She's a bad poet. I've slept in her home many times in Brixton. Every poet in New York has slept in, in Mrs. Booker's house. Um, you know, it's a difference. Like I've written solo theater. There are no asylums for the real crazy women is a solo theater piece. I have about Vivian Elliott, T.S. Elliott's um, wife. And I wrote that knowing that it was going to be a performance piece for the stage. And so it's different. You know, it's definitely like a piece that I'm writing and I'm engaging the audience with the writing. And I know I'm going to be like dealing with the audience and flipping from my, I flipped from my own voice to Vivian Elliott, this, you know, white British woman, you know, born in the 20, 1920s. And so that's performance, you know, that's me writing for the stage. And, and that's different. Um, the poems, I don't write for the stage. So, Cause I write so many poems. And so I have to hear them first. I write the poems first. And then once I read them, I know where they belong. And there's a lot of poems I never put in the books. And there's poems that are in my books that I've never read aloud just because I don't even think they sound that good aloud. I just feel like it's just supposed to be on the page. And, and but people can make that decision based on based on reading it. But I've made my own decisions. I judge my work and say, oh, that sounds, when I read that, it was okay. Yeah, but I think maybe it's better people just read that, you know, they're not going to understand it unless they take it in slow, you know? I mean, I don't know. I think that you, I decide where the work goes after I write it. You know what I mean? Like if I write something, I feel like, you know, this would be better on stage or inside of one of my plays, then I put it in there. Um, or like I have a piece, Alpha Phobia is another theater piece that I've written. And it's, it's poetry and it's narrative at the same time. So there's a mix. There's a mix of poetry. And then I know there's a different place where it's poetry. And then now I'm talking to the audience. So the talking to the audience piece is not, they're not poems. They're like, it's prose. You know, if I'm not doing poetry, it's normally I'm writing in prose. I mean, even my essays are prose. I, I write like a poet, you know, I don't really write like an essayist. I'm working on my book of essays and it's just definitely been a, a, a beautiful struggle for me because it's a different space. And I'm, I'm trying to shape these essays and um, it be taken seriously in that world. But I definitely write from a poet, like the poets go like around the moon and come back, you know, whereas essayists kind of stay on point, have that journalist focus. And that's not necessarily, I don't always stay linear in that kind of way, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Next, let me finish. Um, so I have one other question that's come in. And I mean, I think you kind of answered this a little bit already, um, but uh, it, it, maybe there's a new way that you come at this. Uh, Chelsea Anderson is asking, what made you want to tap into different art forms, such as performing arts and going into uh, education? Like, what is it, you know, that's not, that you can't accomplish in poetry or in one particular genre that makes you go to something else? Well, it's like, you know, why do I want to perform in a country that doesn't, where English isn't the first language? You know what I mean? Because, you know, I, what, it's a dream to perform in South Africa. You know, what a dream. That's like a, that was like a dream come true for me. Uh, so when I, you know, in, in different audiences, I performed in front of all kinds of different cultures and questions. Oh. I, I can't help myself. Like when, like the painting, like if I could just like create visual work. Yeah. Six months just doing that, I would like to do that. Like I would okay. love to just be able to paint. <laughs> all right. I've got, a, I've got one more. I got another great question coming in from our Tony Bolden and oh, I love him. He wants to know uh how do you conceptualize sound in your approach to poetry? Sound. Great, I love that Tony asked that because Tony has my album and was supported my album and his book and CD are in the mail. Um so I've been doing a lot, I did a lot of rock and roll with my poems because I like rock and roll, right? So I wanted to like do the Patti Smith thing. I wanted to like create poems and create a, a space with rock and roll and heavy guitars. And I just thought that was the electric space that like my voice just needed. And then um, it wasn't working. I, like, I went to record the album and it wasn't sounding good sonically inside of the studio setting. So good and fun on stage, Jessica's jumping around, sexy rock and roll outfit, you know, taking poetry into a whole other stratosphere. But it wasn't, I was like, this is not working. And so me and John Dixon um, got together, who's an amazing young pianist out of Detroit, who, you know, he tours with Mike Banks, who's a famous techno uh, producer, who's my good friend. And we got together and he listened to my voice and 
we sat down and he wrote this album listening and writing the melodies and the piano chords around my voice which is why Black Tea, The Legend of Jesse James, my project, which took me my entire career, like over 20 years for me to actually record my first real recording. And it took that long because I wanted it to sonically, I've been trying to find the sounds to balance my poems, my voice, and let that, the music overpower me. I heard some artists who work with poetry and a lot of music where you can't, they're, struck, they're, they're fighting against their own the music. And I didn't want to fight with the music. I want the music to follow me. And, you know, poems like Walking Up One to D.A. Street, that's on my album. That's like my Gil Scott Heron poem. It's like, but I mean, the I wrote like Walking Up One to Street. It's like little brown lady with brown eyes, little brown lady with brown eyes. So my trumpet player goes, ba 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 He's playing my words. Like I wrote the melody to the, the poem already has music in it. So people like take poems, like spoken word artists, right? And they put their poems on these horrible beats that don't have anything to do with their poems. Right. And so I finally think I have found the balance between how do you balance your voice with music is you actually have to create the music has to be wrapped around the poem. You know, it really, it has to be, it has to be that, you know? And so it can't be, yeah. And that's, that's what it is, Tony. Like for me, I know with these poems that, Oh, uh, we lost her again. Um, but we're coming up to the end of the hour that we allotted for the interview. And I think it's been wonderful. As I said in the introduction, I think it's a blessing just to be able to talk with uh, Jessica for a little bit. Um, and so I think I'm going to just close it up now by asking you uh, to please join us for our next webinar in which we will have Mariah Dessa Ikiri Tali on Tuesday, December 1st at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, we'd like to thank KU's Irma Garinger Academic Resource Center staff for making today's uh, uh, interview possible. And again, I want to send a special thanks to uh, Jessica for uh, doing this. Uh, a podcast from today's interview will be available on our website soon. And in the meantime, don't forget to follow us online at the uh, History of Black Writing website, on Twitter, and on our blog uh, about events related to black writing. So see you again soon, next Tuesday. Uh, thanks a lot for showing up. Bye-bye.